Hello, and welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. Today I will be reviewing this book, which I finished a few weeks ago, but just haven't gotten around to making a video about yet, The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson, about the Great Migration, which was a mass movement of millions of blacks from the southern U.S. to various um, northern and western cities from about 1915 through 1970. It was such an awesome page-turner. I absolutely cannot say enough about how wonderful, wonderful this book is and how much I absolutely loved it, although, of course, given the topic, there were some passages that were kind of really hard and emotionally difficult to read, like, for example, about the prevalent racism throughout the Jim Crow South and the lynchings and, like, things like mostly men could be lynched for just for, like, assumption of something. Like, for example, a young black boy innocently giving a, a Valentine's Day card to a girl in his class and he could, you know, end up dead, like, in the river, like, just hanging from a tree, just, like, horrible, horrible things. Just, but thank God we no, li no longer live in a Jim Crow world. I currently live in the modern South and it has, like, come so, so far from what it was, like, even, like, you know, 50 years ago. And so, anyway, this is a synopsis. In this epic, beautifully written masterwork, Pulitzer Prize-winning author Isabel Wilkerson chronicles one of the great untold stories of American history, the decades-long migration of black citizens who fled the South for northern and western cities in search of a better life. From 1915 to 1970, this exodus of almost six million people changed the face of America. Wilkerson interviewed more than a thousand people and gained access to previously untapped data and, unofficial, and official records to write this definitive and vividly dramatic account of how these American journeys unfolded, altering our cities, our country, and ourselves. With stunning detail, Wilkerson tells this story through the lives of three unique individuals. Ida Mae Gladney, who in 1937 left sharecropping and prejudice in Mississippi for Chicago, where she achieved quiet blue-collar success and, in old age, voted for Barack Obama when he ran for an Illinois state Senate seat. Sharp and quick-tempered George Starlin, who in 1945 fled Florida for Harlem, where he endangered his job fighting for civil rights, saw his family fall, but finally found peace in God. And Robert Foster, who left Louisiana in 1953 to pursue medicine, becoming the personal physician to Ray Charles as part of a glitteringly successful career that allowed him to purchase a grand home where he often threw exuberant parties. Wilkerson brilliantly captures her subject's first treacherous and exhausting cross-country trips by car and train, and their new lives in colonies that grew into ghettos, as well as how they changed their new cities with southern food, faith, and culture, and improved them with discipline, drive, and hard work. Both a riveting microcosm and a major assessment, the warmth of other suns is a bold, remarkable work, a superb account of an unrecognized immigration within our own land. Through the breadth of its narrative, the beauty of the writing, the depth of its research, and the fullness of the people and lives portrayed herein, this book was destined to become a classic. And Ms. Wilkerson herself is the daughter of two um, people who migrated during the Great Migration, so it's obviously a very personal topic for her, in addition to obviously being black herself, like her own family experienced it, so like she's kind of drawing on her own family stories as well, and kind of like filling in the blanks, and I'm just going to give a little like synopsis of some notes I took about this book, and I will also leave a link in the description box to the website for this book. There's such really good information there, and the only complaint I have about this book, although it's a bit of a nitpick, she didn't include any pictures throughout. I had to find um, pictures of the individuals on her website, and I'll be um, inserting them into the video when I do editing. And so, um, anyway, the three individuals, as I mentioned, um, Ida May, Brett, Brandon Gladney, who was born on the 5th of March, 1913, in Chickasaw County, Mississippi, and she was um, a sharecropper's wife. She married pretty young, about um, 16, and her husband was about seven years older. But like in that, you know, time and historical context, that was not, you know, particularly creepy like it would be today. And they had a wonderful marriage, and they had eventually um, three children and built a wonderful life for themselves in Chicago. And actually, she and her husband, their children, they had the happiest life of any of the migrants and their families depicted in the book, you know. But the others did have good lives too, but they had, you know, lots of difficulties and stuff and different challenges in their lives and it wasn't as like relatively like happy as Ida May's life was and she first um left in um, October 1937 when she was pregnant with her third child originally she and her husband and children they were living with one of her sisters in Milwaukee which was like a wonderful wonderful city at that time but they eventually she went back down to Mississippi so she could deliver her third child Eleanor whom she named after the first lady Mrs. Roosevelt with a midwife she had heard lots of horrible things about what happened to women who give birth in hospital and unfortunately in that era it was the era of twilight sleep which is like a subject for a whole other topic but it was like pretty horrific so she like went down to deliver with a midwife the old-fashioned way and after that she went back up and they had the family settled in Chicago and the second um, 
person profile is I'm George Swanson Sterling, born the 1st of June, 1918 in Eustis, Florida. His family was living in different cities around Florida, but Eustis was the city they eventually settled in. And he left in April of 1945 for Harlem. And he was kind of like agitating to get better pay. He was like a fruit picker. They would pick all the, the citrus that grows in Florida, like the apricots, the oranges, like grapefruits, like tangerines, peaches, things like that. And he found a way for them to fairly get more money. And a lot of people were like scared. They were afraid what the boss man would do to them. And like it smacked of unionism, which many people unfortunately still to this day have like a kind of a suspicion of. But this was, you know, a fair trade and they were getting like much more money, but there was a threat of lynching hanging over him. So he had to skedaddle out of there. And he worked as a pool man operator for decades. And there's a wonderful movie I saw about 15 years ago. Um, I think it's called um, 10,000 Black Men Named George about the struggle and the ultimately um, successful fight to unionize and get better rights and treatment for the Pullman Poors. If you don't know, these were like, you know, people working on the Pullman trains for many, many decades. That was not obviously not like as good and high ranking as like a doctor or lawyer, but in the era when many um, jobs were close to black people, that was like a pretty decent gig, although obviously they had to withstand a lot of racist treatment from the white passengers. And it's called um, 10,000 Black Men Named George. And this uh, character himself is really, his name really was George because, you know, George Pullman founded the company. And like a lot of these passengers would call all the porters George, which, you know, obviously really disrespectful, but, you know, that's something like really interesting to tell. And he was, you know, going back and forth on all these routes throughout the years. But every time, you know, he went through Florida, he would never get off, even if you know, could take like a lunch break or something, because he was so afraid of being caught out by the people who were looking for him. But, you know, before he left Florida, that was just, you know, something always on his mind. And obviously when you're working on the trained for decades or like in the modern era you'd be like working on an airplane or maybe a cruise ship or something you don't really get to see your family that often or like stay in one place and you're home for very long because you always have to go back on the road and all these routes and obviously that did put a big strain on his family and he's he didn't really have a successful marriage I mean they made it work kind of but he his he was going to college and his father refused to let him pay past his sophomore year and he was a really good student and he wanted to you know do something with his life and get a college degree so he married his girlfriend Inez out of spite and then his after he came back and said oh by the way dad I'm married his father said oh that's a shame I was about to pay for you to continue going to college and he wasn't sure if his father was really like lying to him after he found out he was tricked or he really would have paid for him to go to college but anyway he was kind of like stuck married to this woman and they didn't really have uh, you know the happiest life together even though you know they tried to make it work for the sake of you know like people didn't genuinely divorce in those days, days. and so Anyway, and the last one is Dr. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster. He was born on Christmas Day of 1918, named after one of the um, big generals of World War II in, in Monroe, Louisiana, which was a really interesting city. Oh, and by the way, throughout the book, there are lots of tidbits about these different places, all the people lived in, as well as the places they went to. And a number of famous people like are from Monroe, Louisiana, like, for example, the um, black comedian of classic Hollywood, um, Montan or maybe Mantan, I'm sorry, I've never heard the name pronounced, Moreland, I've seen a number of films by him. He was pretty good, obviously, obviously given the era. Sometimes he was kind of like made to act in a more like caricaturish way, but I really have liked him in some of the films. I saw him, obviously, he's a couple of levels above, like, for example, Step and Fetch It, if you're aware of that kind of comedian. So he, you know, obviously did have more dignity in most of his roles than, unfortunately, some other black actors of the era had. And um, Dr. Pershing drove all the way to California from Louisiana. He's, he had married into kind of a, a, a woman from black royalty. Her father was the president of a historically black college, and so the family was living in the, the mansion provided by the university, and his wife and daughters were more like strangers to him because he was like away from home so long. Like, for example, he went to Austria with the army after World War II, and he was had so much more rights and dignity there as a black man than he did in the U.S., and his in-laws kind of like looked down on him because, oh, you're not as like high-ranking or your practice isn't like glowing as much as like we would like you to be and so anyway his wife and daughters were much more used to like an upscale like rich lifestyle by the time they joined him in California that was a really tough drive for him more than just like going on a train he would you know have to like he wouldn't wasn't able to go in any hotels when he was in the Jim Crow South and once he left El Paso Texas and crossed into the West even then he had to deal with like prejudice and discrimination people said oh I'm sorry you seem like a good guy and I don't agree with racism at all but unfortunately people can't see you entering into this hotel there's just too much risk I'm sorry and he had to you know keep sleeping in his car just keep driving and driving until finally he got to California and unfortunately even in California he encountered 
prejudice and he wasn't able to set up his own practice for a while. He was originally just like, you know, collecting urine samples and doing physicals, which didn't pay that well. And it was kind of obviously humiliating to him. But eventually he did found like a wonderful private practice for himself. And some people who had moved from Monroe themselves came to see him. Dr. Pershing started his drive to California in April of 1953. He was the son of teachers and his father was the principal at one of the local black schools. And unfortunately, given the era, they had to suffer with like insufficient materials, like for example, textbooks woefully out of date. And many times they even had pages ripped out of them. They were like thrown away by the white schools and they had to scavenge for them at the end of every year. And one of his brothers, Madison, was a doctor himself and he was inviting um, Dr. Pershing, um, Robert, his his, he later began going by the name Robert, but officially, like, for our, most of his life until then, he was known as Pershing and decided, you know, to change his name, like, new name, new me when he went to California. And anyway, he thought, oh, maybe I could become, like, a good, like, renowned in-demand doctor here in Monroe, but that's just, you know, not what I'm capable of. I just want more for myself, and there's too much, you know, discrimination. They won't let me into the, like, the main big hospital. I have to have an all-black hospital. Obviously, there's nothing shameful about that, particularly given... The era when he had no choice, but he just, you know, wanted to, like, be a real man, not, like, suffering under Jim Crow with second-class status all the way. And as I mentioned, um, Robert became the personal doctor of Ray Charles. He was even mentioned in one of his songs. He Ray really liked him, and he and his wife named one of their sons after Robert. He was such a good influence, and many of the women whose babies he delivered in California also named their children after him, and he really was chasing a rich lifestyle throughout his life, he just wanted to show he had made it, like particularly to his in-laws who were constantly looking down on him for not being as, you know, hoity-toity and naturally coming by blue blood, blue blood statuses. They were, and he loved going to the casinos in Las Vegas. And his first trip there, he was humiliated because he was told by a friend, oh, go to this hotel, they'll totally have room for you. And unfortunately, when he got there, they said, oh, we don't serve black people, like Negroes, they would have said in those days. So they had to like drive to another hotel. And then fortunately, as time went on, he was like accepted in all the hotels and he really had good luck and many times he gambled like sometimes he would come home with as much as fifty thousand dollars but unfortunately other times he didn't do so well but you know that was just something he absolutely loved gambling it really made him happy and there's another thing in the book he planned a lavish 50th birthday party for himself to show how far he had made in all these like wonderful elaborate preparations like the clothes his wife and daughters were wearing and the food and the champagne they were serving it was just you know something really really important to him although unfortunately he didn't quite have the level of success he had hoped, even though he did do like very, very well for himself financially. One of the anecdotes, the vignettes in this book, I found particularly fun talking about George working on the Pullman trains. These people, like sometimes they weren't sure if they would ever go back to the South for obvious reasons. So they were basically taking everything but the kitchen sink with them. And sometimes it was like hard to lift the trunks and suitcases and the handles would fall off. And one of these things like the suitcase flew open and suddenly the floor of the train car was littered with like sweet potatoes and people were laughing and, you know, picking them up, getting some extra for themselves. Or sometimes there was one bag like dripping blood and he was didn't know what this was. He thought, oh, maybe it's a freshly slaughtered hog. They didn't really have the time to butcher and cook yet. So obviously they have hogs in the north. I'm a vegetarian myself. I don't eat meat. And obviously pork meat is like non-kosher as well. But anyway, these people were just, you know, thinking, oh, I've got to like take as much as I can. It might not even have homegrown familiar southern food for a long time if ever so I've got to take as much as I can while I still have access to it and it's just like really one of the things people missed about the south was food and there was another thing I bookmarked in here there were a couple of really interesting vignettes like for example it also talks about like well, how corporal punishment has its roots in um, slavery and Jim Crow people were like obviously it corporal punishment is wrong we have like 50 plus of research from various like disciplines to prove this but anyway it's remained high in the black community and was even higher back in the like Jim Crow era because of direct outgrowth of slavery people felt you know they were doing their children a favor teaching them to you know, be like in line and not risk being god forbid like lynched or attacked or something horrible like that because if you know people think you're misbehaving so they'd better learn to like stay in line all the time and not do anything that could arouse suspicion or anything like that and they felt like whipping them into submission would like help them, you know, just like keep your head down, know your place. And I mentioned this in a recent um, library hall. This is a book on the very subject, Spare the Kids, Why Whooping Children Won't Save Black America by Stacey Patton. And it's a really, really interesting topic. And another thing I bookmarked was about um, names in the black community. As many people might be aware of, they, many black people have like unusual nicknames. They're not unusual, just like names that aren't based off their actual name. Like, for example, like Bob from Robert or Katie from Catherine or something like that, and it's kind of like explains the origin of those names. A name was a serious undertaking. It was the first and maybe only thing colored parents could give a child. 
and they were often sentimental about it. They had a habit of recycling the names of beloved kin people, thus ending up with three or four Lou Della's in one or two generations. Out of the confusion it created, children got nicknames like Boo or Pip or Sweet, which after repeated use meant nobody knew anybody's given name until they got married or died. It left mourners at southern funerals not knowing for sure who was in the casket, unless the preacher called out Junebug in the eulogy. Oh, that's Junebug that died! Sometimes parents tried to superimpose glory on their offspring with the grandest title they could think of, or if they were feeling especially militant, the name of a senator or president from the North. It was a way of affixing acceptability, if not greatness. It forced everyone, colored and white, to call their janitor sons Admiral or General or John Quincy Adams, whether anybody, including the recipient, liked it or not. White Southerners who would not call colored people Mr. or Mrs. were made to sputter out Colonel or Queen instead. And that was something really appreciated learning that detail about, you know, black culture and where these like unusual or just different nicknames come from. Ms. Wilderson discusses how the trains followed a few common routes, like, for example, people wouldn't just say, oh, I feel more like living in Minneapolis instead of Chicago, or I really think Boston would be a better fit for me and my family than Los Angeles or something like that, because you basically, depending on which region you originated from, that was where the train would ultimately take you for, like, for example, many people from Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia would go to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City. Newark and Boston. She also mentions how many people probably ended up in Newark by accident because obviously New York and New York City are so close together and the names sound alike too so they got confused and got off at their wrong station and that's how a lot of like black migrants during the Great Migration like ended up settling in Newark instead and actually many people might not realize this but until the Newark riots of 1967 Newark was like a really really wonderful desirable city and also had I think like the fourth maybe largest Jewish community in the U.S. up until the time it was not you know like a rundown like crime hole like many people associate it with it was a much much nicer city in bygone decades and people from Mississippi Alabama Tennessee and Arkansas most commonly went to Cleveland Detroit Chicago Milwaukee and my own um, home city of Pittsburgh and many people who came from Louisiana and Texas like um, Dr. Pershing went to the West Coast Ms. Wilkerson also discusses the culture shock experienced by many migrants. Obviously, this happens no, no matter where you migrate or immigrate from. You're like missing pieces of your home country or like state or region or whatever that you just can't find in the new place. Like even if you settle with a community of like immigrants, like for example, like Little Italy or Chinatown or Russia or Japantown, you it's not exactly 100% the same as like the culture you left behind because it's obviously like replicated to some extent. You like for example, you don't have the same kinds of flowers growing and she mentions they had like for example no wide open spaces like you're used to living to like when you move to a big city obviously sometimes you can have a, a neighborhood with more suburban feel or an exurb a very very nearby city with like larger houses and wide open spaces but it's not the same as you know when you live in the heart of the city you pretty much have no choice barring a couple of neighborhoods to like live in like a like a row house sharing walls with other places or an apartment and they also miss you know having farms like farming for a living obviously sharecroppers were horribly exploited but they were you know just used to growing their own food and the joy of like eating something you grew yourself from like planting and seeing through every thing of it and they, they obviously they left their loved ones behind in the southern cuisine many people many people nowadays really like southern cuisine even if they don't live in the south but in those days it was like mostly tied to the region of the south and they like really missed all these recipes they had left behind their certain Flowers, like for example, Ms. Wilkerson mentions her mother missing a particular flower from the South a lot in the churches, the little home churches they left behind in the South, and sometimes they would have to like start all over again with a, like a much larger church and just things like that. And they, to this extent, they founded many regional clubs for different cities and states they left behind so they could, you know, still feel kind of connected to the old home country. And she does mention a little bit, obviously, by the time she's interviewing these people in like 1996 and 1997, the cities, particularly Chicago and New York, had kind of like really, really gone downhill from the way they were in the 30s and 40s. Obviously, the reasons for that are like way too like complicated and long-winded to get into here, but obviously there was a lot of urban decay and it was caused by factors like, for example, the white flight to suburbia in the post-World um, War II era on um, redlining. They would like do maps of a city and they would draw in red the places like supposedly people didn't want to invest in and that those prices, or the properties became like much, much 
cheaper and run down because people didn't want to do upkeep to them. And when the like the rich and the bourgeoisie tax base were leaving these cities in droves and then just basically left behind the, the poor and the working class who couldn't like pay enough uh, as much tax into the city and therefore like the schools and like houses and apartments and parks and such would start declining and then like urban renewal. Like for example, like many people might be familiar in New York City, Robert Moses was busy, busy ripping up all these historic neighborhoods and like quarters to build like horrible new highways nobody had asked for and basically displacing lots of neighborhoods, including many which were historically like black and Hispanic or even like white working class neighborhoods. These people had nowhere to go and then they were stuffed into like horrible high rises, just horrible things like that. And like, you know, block busting when you would, they would convince white people, oh, the neighborhood's going downhill because there are black people moving in here. Oh, you don't want to live here, do you? And they would sell their price, their houses like below market price. And then they, the, these greedy landlords would sell them above market price to the black people who were left in the area, just like really, really horrible things. But she does mention Ms. Wilkerson in the book that, um, like George and Ida were treated very well, even by this new generation of people, because they, you know, respected what they had come from and lived through in their life, like fleeing from the South, they were kind of looking after them, even though they might not be like such good or moral people in their the rest of their lives, they had a kind of a soft spot for these older, oh, George, I noticed your car light was on at two in the morning, you better check that out, or these like, you know, gangbangers, like helping Ida cross the street, or oh, hello, Grandma, how are you doing today? It's such a nice day, I'm happy to see you, things like that. Ms. Wilkerson also discusses how race, racism didn't go away once they were in the North. Obviously, they could breathe the sigh of relief once they you know, crossed into border states like, you know, Illinois or like Arizona or like Washington, D.C. But unfortunately, people still had attitudes. Obviously, it wasn't as bad as Jim Crow in most cases. They weren't like, legally kept out of like schools or jobs, but there were just like many, many challenges and prejudice they still had to face. And this is like so, so horrifying. I'm going to we, the expert, obviously, this is like a content warning, which I don't normally do, but it's just like horrible, horrible what happened. And many people just don't realize. And these people who were like doing this, basically a pog racist pogrom against these people who actually, God forbid, they wanted to move into a white neighborhood instead of like knowing their place and sticking to the, the black neighborhood and living in, a, in an apartment all their lives. These were not, you know, like hoity-toity rich wasps. These were like white working class people from like, mostly like Southern and Eastern Central European background so obviously they were like you know strangers in a strange land themselves not so long ago and they could just like react like this is just so horrible I just I'm so glad I was born in 1979 and I never really knew a world where so many people like took for granted oh everyone is going to be racist and these are just like attitudes and I don't see anything wrong or disgusting about treating other people like this like thank god I you know live in the modern era. Ida May and her family moved from flat to flat within those walls once they lived in an apartment over a funeral home, where little Eleanor played among the caskets and rode with the undertaker to pick up bodies. As it was, Chicago was trying to discourage the migration of any more colored people from the South. In 1950, city aldermen and housing officials proposed restricting 13,000 new public housing units to people who had lived in Chicago for two years. The rule would presumably affect colored migrants and foreign immigrants alike, but it was the colored people who were having the most trouble finding housing and most likely to seek out such an alternative. And it was they who were seen as needing to be controlled, as they had only to catch a train rather than cross an ocean to get there. Nothing had worked before at keeping the migrants at once the migration began, and this new plan wouldn't either. But it was a sign of the hostility facing people like Harvey Clark and Ida May, as white homeowners stepped up pressure on the city to protect their neighborhoods. They don't want the Negro who has just moved out of rural Dixie as their neighbor, a city official told the Chicago Defender, in a story that described what it called a two-year city ban on migrants. With close to half a million colored people overflowing the Black Belt by 1950, racial walls that had been successfully defended for a generation, in the words of the historian Alan Speer, were facing imminent collapse, but not without a fight. Chicago found itself in the midst of chronic urban guerrilla warfare that rivaled the city's violent spasms at the start of the migration, when one racially motivated bombing or arson occurred every 20 days, according to the historian Arnold Hirsch. Harvey Clark was from Mississippi like Ida May and brought his family to Chicago in 1949 after serving in World War II. Now that they were in the big city, the couple and their two children were crammed into two, half of a two-room apartment. A family of five lived in the other half. Harvey Clark was paying $56 a month for the privilege, up to 50% more than tenants in white neighborhoods paid for the same amount of space. One-room tenement life did not fit them at all. The husband and wife were college-educated, ed well-mannered, and looked like movie stars. 
The father had saved up for a piano for his eight-year-old daughter with the ringlets down her back, but had no place to put it. He had high aspirations for their six-year-old son, who was bright and whose dimples could have landed him in cereal commercials. The Clarks felt they had to get out. By May of 1951, they finally found the perfect apartment. It had five rooms, was clean and modern, was closer to the bus terminal, cost only $60 a month. It came to $4 a month, more for, more for five times more space. It was just a block over the Chicago line at 6139 West 19th Street in the working class suburb of Cicero. The Clarks couldn't believe their good fortune. Cicero was an all-white town on the southwest border of Chicago. It was known as the place Al Capone went to elude Chicago authorities back during Prohibition. The town was filled with first and second generation immigrants, Czechs, Slavs, Poles, Italians. Some had fled fascism and Stalinism, not unlike blacks fleeing oppression in the South, and were still getting established in the New World. They lived in frame cottages and worked the factories and slaughterhouses. They were miles from the Black Belt, isolated from it, and bent on keeping their town as it was. That the Clarks turned there at all was an indication of how closed the options were for colored families, looking for clean, spacious housing they could afford. The Clarks set the move-in date for the third week of June. The moving truck arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon. White protesters met them as the couple tried to unload the truck. Get out of Cicero, the protesters told them, and don't come back. As the Clarks started to enter the building, the police stopped them at the door. The police took sides with the protesters and would not let the Clarks nor their furniture in. You should know better, the chief of police told them. Get going. Get out of here fast. There will be no moving in that building. The Clarks, along with their rental agent, Charles Edwards, fled the scene. Don't come back in town, the chief reportedly told Edwards, or you'll get a bullet through you. The Clarks did not let that deter them, but sued and won the right to occupy the apartment. They tried to move in again on July 11, 1951. This time, a hundred Cicero housewives and grandmothers in swing coats and Mamie Eisenhower hats showed up to heckle them. The couple managed to get their furniture in, but as the day wore on, the crowds grew larger and more agitated. A man from a white supremacy group called the White Circle League handed out flyers that said, Keep Cicero White. The Clarks fled. A mob stormed the apartment and threw the family's furniture out of a third-floor window as the crowds cheered below. The neighbors burned the couple's marriage license and the children's baby pictures. They overturned the refrigerator, tore the stove and plumbing fixtures out of the wall. They tore up the carpet. They shattered the mirrors. They bashed in the toilet bowl. They ripped out the radiators. They smashed the piano Clark had worked overtime to buy for his daughter. And when they were done, they set the whole pile of the family's belongings, now strewn on the ground below, on fire. In an hour, the mob destroyed what had taken nine years to acquire, wrote the historian Stephen Grant Meyer of what happened that night. The next day, a full-out riot was underway. The mob grew to 4,000 by early evening as teenagers got out of school. Husbands returned home from work, and all of them joined the housewives, who had kept a day-long vigil in protest of the Clark's arrival. They chanted, go, 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 go. They hurled rocks and bricks. They looted. Then they firebombed the whole building. They, the bombing gutted the 20-unit building and forced even the white tenants out. The rioters overturned police cars and threw stones at the firefighters, who were trying to put out the blaze. Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson had to call in the National Guard, the first time the Guard had been summoned for a racial incident since the 1919 riots and the early years of the migration. It took four hours for more than 600 guardsmen, police officers, and sheriff's deputies to beat back the mob that night and three more days for the rioting over the Clarks to subside. A total of 118 men were arrested in the riot, but Cook County Grand Jury failed to indict any of the rioters. Town officials did not blame the mob for the riot, but rather the people who, in their view, should never have rented the apartment to the Clarks in the first place. To make an example of such people, indictments were handed down against the rental agent, the owner of the apartment building, and others who had helped the Clarks on charges of inciting a riot. The indictments were later dropped. In spite of everything, the Clarks still felt they had a right to live in a city with good, affordable housing stock, but the racial hostility made it all but impossible to return. That's just such a horrifying incident from American history. Many people don't know about this happening at all, and many people also, they might know about the Great Migration like an, on a surface level that it happened. Like, for example, like I grew up in Albany, New York, and so the New York State Museum has a big exhibit on like black history, like the Harlem Renaissance, things like that, and they mention the migration and that exhibit, but many people just like don't know about it in detail. Like this book goes into, and it's such it's such a wonderful resource. I would highly recommend it. So anyway, I really, really would highly recommend this book. I really liked reading it. Although obviously, of course, as I mentioned, the thing I just read, there are some very emotionally difficult things to read, like the pervasiveness about like racism and 
lynching, like even in the North, things happen. And as Ms. Wilkerson says in the book, one of the reasons the Great Migration eventually came to the to an end in the early 1970s was because, you know, Jim Crow was finally defeated for good and like people were no longer protesting school desegregation. They were just like accepted it as a fact and more and more black people began moving back to the U.S. South and like kind of revitalizing it. And so like it's much, much different now than it was like 100 or even like, you know, like 50, 60 years ago. And thank God for that. So thank you very much for listening to the end. If you've not already, um, please consider subscribing. I talk about a lot of like serious classic world literature and important like historical nonfiction like this, most of my videos. And I would particularly like seeing comments from people. I really, really want to get to know people and know what you think about, you know, my channel and the kind of content I should make more of and just become like overall friends with people. And if you've not already, um, hit the notification bell so you can be notified when I upload new videos because I would hate to think any of my subscribers have been missing out on my content all this time. And I will see you guys again very soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.